it, taking all this into account that these days, especially a lot of the young people that we work with, maybe are producing a whole track by themselves. Right. Maybe, you know, they might be collaborating with another artist, but a lot of them, it's, it's a lot more self-contained. Right. What, what is your advice to a new generation who maybe don't have that experience of collaboration, of the group dynamic, of, of right. working in the professional studio, and right. sort of are trying to go it alone and do this. Right. What if you could? And I suppose almost if you could go back and talk to yourself as a as a, a younger man and say, you know, when right. you're starting out. But just what's your kind of general advice for them in terms of, I suppose, making a record, but also just staying sane while they do it. Right. <laughs> Forget about staying sane while you do it. That's my first piece of advice. Okay. Go insane. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, and part of what I mean by that again is that is that really immerse really immerse yourself in the thing that you're that you're doing and find somebody who can at least be, you know, that's, that's sort of the role that I play with these artists as mentor and coach is, is, uh, is just really encouraging them to, when they want to say, ah, oh, do you think it's good enough? No, it's not good enough. Keep going. Um, but I would say one important thing is really learn the legacy, you know, listen to the history, you know, listen and try and really so to, to understand what makes a song a great song and what makes that record feel the way that it does. Right. And really get that stuff into your into your into your body. So you really understand where you're where you're coming from. I think any older person in music always tries to encourage young folks to do that. But uh, I'm amazed uh, at the the actors that I work with who don't know you know, certain, I was working with one guy who didn't know who Marlon Brando was. It's like, how right. did you not know who Marlon Brando is? <laughs> yeah. you know, but still, like, even The Godfather, not yeah, like yeah. Streetcar Named Desire, like, everybody's yeah. seen The Godfather. Yeah. Who Marlon Brando? So I think you really need to uh, not shirk that responsibility to know, to know the history. And, you know, as somebody who, um, you know, grew up in the 60s and the 70s, for me, uh, you know, English music, that was like, you know, that was the holy grail, you know, that was like, <laughs> that was the greatest, and it was exotic, and it was across, the, and, you know, so I was, I was devouring all that stuff, you know, a few hours, or a few years earlier, Mick and Keith were devouring American blues, yeah. right, I was devouring English music, yeah. right? like, but that was, you know, there was a lot of interest in, like, what, what is something that is outside of my familiar place? Yeah. And my yeah. kids have this amazing ability to know when I try to play something that isn't contemporary pop music. Like, no, turn that off. <laughs> like, How did you know? Like, I just, I try to sneak it in, you know, and, and, uh, and it's, it takes work to get them to open their minds in that yeah. regard. Um, I also think that, that, you know, figure out ways to get support. Yeah. You know, that they're not just doing it on their own. Mm. Uh, I think that that's a, a, a really important thing. And in order to cultivate those those qualities that I talked about, you know, in terms of uh, a standard, a standard of excellence, you yeah. know, that's the thing that we learn from from others and from our masters. And, and I, if I look back on myself and said, what would I have done differently? It's related to this, which is that I would have asked more questions. I wouldn't have tried so hard to appear like I knew it all. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. And I think with our students, that's the thing, like be a student, you know, be an idiot and, and ask. Yeah. There were so many people I hung out with who I didn't know the incredible stories of their lives, you know. And and then now in the, the age of Wikipedia, I'll read about somebody that I work with. It's like he did what? <laughs> I never asked him about that. Like I never said. So what were you doing before we you did this? And 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 I missed so much in terms of what I could have learned if I would have been willing to, uh, you know, yeah. be stupid. Yeah. Okay, so be stupid and go crazy being the se the central central points there. <laughs> and um, so I suppose the great history of rock and roll. <laughs> so I suppose a sort of sort of final question. Um, yeah. One thing that I I kind of got a sense of was that through the book there was a sense of you kind of seeing behind the veil. So yeah. there's a there's a moment where you saw Paul Simon being critical of Art Garfunkel. Right. And that was quite kind of controversial at the time. Right. There was another moment where after a take, Dylan 
said um, in a kind of sarcastic tone, was that sincere enough? Yeah. Um, I suppose kind of poking fun at his own uh, sort of image or reputation for being right. so sincere. And yeah. you find it quite disillusioning to kind of see see that kind of side of music that people maybe, you know, were putting on the um, the persona that the public then saw, which I suppose with artists as seminal as those for you must have been quite, must have been quite difficult to be in that time when that music was in the air and was the kind of fabric of this change, but then to see yeah. behind. So sort of, yeah, if you could just maybe tell us a little bit about how that, how that felt or what, what you kind of took away from seeing behind the veil or being part of that kind of, you know, such a seminal period of history that we still talk about now. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the reasons that I wrote the book or one of the things that drove me to write the book, um, were the unresolved feelings that I had about the very thing that you're talking about that I, I still, even as a, as a, as somebody decades later who became a psychotherapist, I still, um, was confused about those kinds of experiences and I still harbored misgivings about those kinds of things where these, uh, you know, these idols, uh, of, of my youth, um, I discovered were, uh, sometimes very flawed human beings. Uh, and, and how did I reconcile this, this great music with them being, um, far from exemplary human beings? Um, and the, what I what I discovered through the writing of the book was, and and this is where my current profession really helped as well, is that what was behind. So there's the public persona, and then behind the public persona is what I saw, which was sometimes very bad treatment of other human beings. Um, but what I realized was behind that was a lot of pain, mm. and that's really what helped me. You know, all artists suffer. Um, and and it and obviously, as we say, the most sensitive people go into it, and it's a brutal, it's a brutal life. And and basically, a lot of that stuff is an expression of, albeit, you know, certainly not the most functional expression. But it but I I could see the pain in a character like Paul Simon or a character like Bob. When you look at their outward behavior and say these people are jerks, man. Mm. Uh, and in many ways they were, but uh, once I could perceive that we had that we had a commonality in the pain, mm. then I was able to be much more compassionate. And today, any artist who on the surface looks difficult, and I, I'm working with somebody now who <clears throat> who's in a band and um, and 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 he's dealing with the the lead singer of the band, and you know they're very popular, and I can't name who it is because of confidentiality. But the, the leader of the band is a very, very difficult character, mm. and it's proving very, very difficult for this musician. And I, and I have a lot of compassion for that, but, but I also understand the woundedness mm. that, lead, that, that that artist is, is coming from. You know, narcissists, if we want to use that word, um, uh, have a, it, it, they're very difficult to tolerate, but they're coming from a place of deep, deep woundedness and pain. And if I can see through to that, then it, it, it's really helped me to accept and understand uh, the, the kind of the bad behavior that I witnessed. Sure. And and I suppose, yeah, that, that kind of finishes on something that I, I was really struck by, is that these people who made these records that, you know, I've been listening to them my whole life, that I'm sure they'll be part of my children's lives and Right. probably even my grandchildren's lives. These are records that will last the test of time. Yeah. Um, but the people who made them were actually quite dissatisfied with how they turned out a lot of the time. So, <laughs> you, you know, the, e e even... And I, I saw I saw a documentary with Paul Simon a little while ago where he was talking about the lyrics to some of his biggest songs and saying, oh, I, you know, I should have left out that third verse or I should have changed that lyric there. And, right. I, and I, I got a sense of that from um, from your book where... It, it kind of always seems like there's always one more take that you should have done, you know. Right. How, however, however huge the song is, however great it is, um, and I don't know. Do you maybe think is that something that can almost give hope to the young people that we work with? Where, say, if you have got someone a, a Mick Jagger or a Sinatra, yeah. if they're if they're still not a hundred percent satisfied, does that maybe say something to young artists starting out about that what they're doing? 
Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the letter that um, Martha Graham, who invented modern dance, wrote to her, one of her students, Agnes DeMille, uh, who was a wonderful choreographer, you know, world famous choreographer. And Agnes DeMille was just coming up and she was moaning and groaning about her own limitations. And it's a beautiful letter and I, I recommend that you find it online. But, but the line that I like best so here's the Martha Graham, who's the greatest modern dancer ever, talking to this amazingly wonderful choreographer. And she says, there, for the artist, there is no satisfaction whatsoever at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that to your students. But there is a queer divine dissatisfaction that keeps us questing, that yes. keeps us going after this thing that drives us and keeps us you know doing the work that that we do yeah. and i think that's you know that's that's yeah. the message that they that yeah that's a that's a really beautiful um, beautiful sentiment and yeah. um the, the the other sentiment that i really loved was you mentioned uh, a tolstoy story in the book yeah. and that was one thing that really stayed with me um the idea that it's it's not given to us to know what is good for ourselves, only what is good for each other. And right. that because of that, we are bound by care. And right. I just thought that was such a beautiful, beautiful way of expressing something that I think maybe I've felt, but not quite been able to express. Right. And, um, and yeah, I kind of, I, I got a sense that maybe that, although it was obviously a very cutthroat environment, maybe the, that studio A&R where you kind of cut your teeth and, and learnt the ropes, maybe there was a sense of that, because you were effectively helping other people create art and you were all working collaboratively together that even though externally it looked quite savage actually there was that sense of being kind of bound by care that you're all working towards something and I, I, yeah that just that's that's what I came away from the book with a, a sense that that idea of caring for each other because we don't know what's good for ourselves is quite a powerful powerful right. idea and maybe that's what we're actually all trying to do through music yeah what else are we doing it for right we're trying to connect to others and we're, we're trying to yeah we're trying to communicate we're trying to um, give something to the world to make it a little bit of a better place with music and I think that that's so necessary that's the other thing I would say to young people coming up is whatever however difficult this this is that in this day and age, in this political climate, that that it, where arts are are less important, I think, than than they have been, but they're more important because of that. Uh, that that we're the creators. There's a lot of destroyers out there, and and we're the ones who are you know keeping keeping the hope alive mm. through creating, and and so there is a purpose, and and it and it does have to come from care, and yeah, I mean that was like. The New York thing. We didn't want to say that we really cared because we wanted to appear like, you know, tough New Yorkers. But really, any time I get together with anybody who was in that in that environment, we know we shared something that that was irreplaceable. It was a peak of our lives, and it was because we were caring. We were we were being asked to care, and we were caring on a deeper level than than you do in, in ordinary day-to-day -day life. Mm. And there's something, and that gives life meaning and purpose. Mm. And do you do you see any echo of those times in, in what's happening at the moment? Because I saw, I saw you wrote a blog recently um, about the, uh, the protests over uh, gun laws in America. And uh, yeah, it was, I, I read it and I felt myself agreeing with everything you were saying. But I, I've been wondering if, you know, looking at the cycles of history are we entering into maybe something that is reminiscent of the 60s or there is there's obviously such huge upheaval going on at the moment could it have that same kind of sort of positive aspect to it or i don't know what's I your sense so. i hope so and i know that in every great social movement uh music has played a central part and and um and i hope that i hope that musicians can also uh, understand their their not only responsibility but just the the, the power of their influence uh, socially mm. and and what music does to unify people you know bring, I mean it's 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 a wonderful thing 
that, and, and, I mean, wonderful in its way, but um, wherever my friends, you know, my Facebook friends are on the political spectrum, uh, and I have some friends who are on the opposite end than I am, we all agree about music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all love the same yeah. music. I mean, yeah. you know, like different music, but but in terms of like the classic stuff, yeah, yeah. we're talking about. There's no disagreement. Like somebody yeah. will some or some <laughs> post some YouTube track, and it's like, yeah, man, like that. <laughs> yeah. We don't get any fights about that. Yeah. You know? So you know that's where music really can can bring us uh, together. Yeah, well, I, I'm realizing I gotta, I gotta, I yeah, gotta. I was gonna say, I think maybe that's a, that's a great place to wrap it up. That um, yeah. yeah, music can bring us all together. Well, thanks so much for speaking to us. This was so um, much fun. This was yeah, so great. No, it's been a, yeah, kind of personally and for everyone listening, it'll be um, really, really inspiring. And um, yeah, well, thanks so much. And um, yeah, I'm gonna make sure everybody checks out your book.